Thanks so much for having me. We're going to talk about my story first, and then I'm going to give you some high-level information on personal branding, and then I'm going to walk you through the four-step personal branding process that's in Me 2.0, the book that all of you have in front of you. So when I got started, when I got started, I had eight internships and seven leadership positions in college. I was trying to figure out everything on my own. So I started from really nothing. And I had to get each internship in order to build my profile to get the next internship. I went to these internships with what I call now a personal branding toolkit, different materials that help sell me as a person now, as a brand. So a business card, a website, a CD portfolio of work, like all these materials, and that they would help me stand out during these interviews. The problem that I had was I never networked, and I was a little been afraid to network. And as a result, it took me eight months meeting 15 people, getting rejected twice to get my first job out of school, so it was a hard lesson learned. But one of the most fascinating things that, that happened um, before I got my job at EMC was during one of the last interviews, they looked at my resume, which was two pages, and they said, wow, you worked at Reebok. Now, when I had my internship at Reebok, I did almost nothing, I hate to admit, maybe people watching <laughs> that work at Reebok, but I had so much, in, so much experience at the smaller firms, but they cared about Reebok because Reebok was a brand, and the brand opened the door, I got the job. And then, about a year later, I read Tom Peters' Brand Called You article, which was written back in 1997 in the, on the cover of Fast Company magazine. And when I read this article, it called out to me. He was saying, you have to be the chief marketing officer for the brand called you. You have to be the CEO of Me, Inc. And reading his article, I was like, wow, this is exactly what I've been doing all along, marketing myself, without even knowing of that term. And so I started the personal branding blog, which is now personalbrandingblog.com. It used to be personalbrandingblog.wordpress.com when I was first started. And when I started this, I started writing 10 to 12 posts a week because I loved to do it. I knew that I could probably become the spokesperson of my generation. I'm 27, I was 23 years old then. So I just started writing, just getting my ideas out, and everything that I had learned along the way, getting the internships, getting the job throughout college to help other individuals who were struggling. And then what I did was I started a few more projects. Go through a few of these. The Personal Brand Awards, how they wanted to recognize people who are already really successful building brands online. And I also did Personal Branding TV, which was very uncomfortable for me. I still don't really like doing video. But I put videos of myself interviewing CEOs and executives. I even interviewed my own uncle. And I also gave like chalkboard lectures and tried to get my ideas out in a different format because I believe that you pretty much have to put everything in any format that your audience is looking for right now. And then what I did was I wrote articles. Now I had never written articles before. I didn't consider myself a writer. I didn't think I was that great of a writer during high school or college. And I got the opportunity to write for about.com, which was my first opportunity to write. And it was published. And when it was published, I was like, wow, this is incredible. Someone's willing to publish something that I wrote. I took that published work, and any time you get published, you get a lot of benefits from it. Positions you as an expert, it, you get links back to your site, increases your Google standing, and, and, and you know, builds traffic to your site. So it's really good, it really helps you. And I took that published article, and I used it to get my next opportunity. So my next opportunity was with the American Market Association. I wrote a best practice on personal branding for them. Used both of those published works to get my next opportunity. It took me six months, but I got published in Brain Week magazine, which was a pretty big deal at the time for me. And then I just kept building and building. And, and while I was building that, I was still blogging. I was commenting on any single blog that mentioned personal branding. So it's a ton of work. So you have you know, 40 to 50 hours a week at my day job at EMC Corporation doing product marketing. And then I'd go home, I'd sacrifice nights, I'd sacrifice weekends to continue to build on something that I truly believed in, not getting any money to do any of this. And then I started 
personal branding magazine because I want to continue to position myself as an expert because I call myself a personal branding spokesperson for Gen Y. I didn't want to just take the expert status right away. I wanted to feel like I proved myself and that was worthy of the expert status. So first, the first issue had 11 articles and the cover was Donald Trump, an interview between him and Guy Kawasaki. And on that day, when it launched, I was also profiled in Fast Company, which was 10 years to the day Tom Peters' article came out, but more positioning me as you know, the person who understood personal branding for the younger generation tied with this new social media technology, which was really heating up at this point. You know, Facebook has like 700 million users now. So at that point, it was, it was starting to go a little bit more mainstream back in 2007. And when it launched, I never told my employer what I was doing outside of work. It was a hobby. I wasn't making money. It wasn't, I didn't see it as a big deal. PR got wind of it because I, it noted that I was working at EMC, a you know, product marketing role at this point, while doing everything else. PR sent it to a vice president. Vice president called me into his office, which was a big deal. I was entry-level candidate. It was very intimidating. And then he introduced me to the head of public relations. The head of public relations called me in. And it took me so much work, so over so such a long period of time to get in this company, and now they're coming to me based on my online personal brand, something I built based on my passion. So that to me that was profound, and I was ready to really market myself to this head of PR. I said, you know, I brought in a press kit, I brought, brought in a, a printed copy of the Brand Week magazine article. I was doing whatever I could, but I was already sold through that third-party endorsement based on everything I was doing outside of work. And so I was able to co-create the first social media position back in November 2007, which inspired me to write Me 2.0. That's, now you have the second edition now, but back then I got my own book deal. I got rejected by 70 agents. You can say. I got rejected by 70 agents and two publishers. Kept with it in January 2008, I got the book deal. And then after you know, speaking at more companies and, and continually building upon what I had already been doing and building more of a business model around that with consulting and speaking and the advertising platform that I've created, I started Millennial Branding LLC. And that's my company now. What are these two toddlers talking about? They're talking about their online brand because 92% of them already have one. And why I bring this up is it's not really the content that they're creating about themselves. Even though 80% of them use the internet, they're just not that savvy at this point. It's what other people are creating about them. And that's why you need to own your brand, because if you don't take a stand, if you don't publish content based on your passion, what you want to become an expert in, and really get yourself out there, other people will have control over your career and future. I look at the internet different than most people. I look at it as the global talent pool. It's where all the recruitings occur. It's where all the opportunities are. And for that reason, you need to build an online presence. You need your own website at yourfullname.com. You need to be on the social networks because people need to find you. Because if people are searching for you or people like you, you have to come up or you're going to lose an opportunity every single time they perform that Google search. And more and more employers are saying, forget about the resume, we are just going to search for you online and whatever comes up, that's going to depict whether you get the job or not. As you can see, 34% of companies feel that the online presence is really taking over the resume. And this trend is just continuing. There's three skills you need, or three main big ideas, is that the first one is you need hard skills. And back in the day, if you had the right hard skills, if you got the degree, if you were a good software programmer, you'd be pretty much guaranteed a job. And then it became more competitive to get jobs. So now, you, not only do you have to be able to program, let's say, but you need good communication skills. You need to be well organized. You have to be able to talk with people. You have to be able to be a good writer. You have to fit in the corporate culture. All these things, leadership, all these things became more and more important. And now we're entering another stage where not only do you have to have great hard skills and soft skills, but you have to have online influence. And we're going to talk about more. Uh, about that towards the end of the presentation. You have to be able to establish a strong network. You have to be able to you know, have people listen to what you have to say and maybe retweet you and spread your messages. And that's going to count for more and more in the future. And you don't want to end up like the dinosaurs. And the, I think the biggest challenge for people now and in the future is to stay relevant. It's becoming so hard. I mean, I read and skim 800 RSS feeds a day in order to keep up. I mean, it's my business to keep up, but in a sense, 
if you don't know what's going on with your company, your industry, and, and technology, then you're going to be outdated and irrelevant to the marketplace, and that's going to really hurt your career. And that's why I think blogging is, is really important, because it forces you to read, because the best bloggers are the best readers. The more you understand what's going on, you can make more predictions, you can cite research, it, there's so much more you can do with that content. And there's been a big branding shift. I think people have to act more like companies, behave more like companies. At the end of the day, success is during hands. You have to be in the driver's seat of your career, not the passenger seat. And then companies have to act more like individuals because consumers want to interact with companies. And there's a report yesterday that said 56% of people on social networks are looking for responses to their questions from companies. So there's a huge demand for it. It's going to always increase. And so it's very important that companies tap their employees to connect in a human fashion with the outside world. And this is the four-step personal branding process. Discover is about figuring out who you are, how you want to brand yourself. And I always say for people who work in companies, becoming the go-to expert on a specific topic or skill within your company. So when people need that skill or need some advice, they go to, that, they go to you each time. And that's how you build value. Establishing short-term and long-term goals, making sure both of those align as well. Create is about creating the personal brand toolkit, like I mentioned earlier. It's all the materials that you need to help sell you, whether you're a job seeker or employed or you're an entrepreneur. You always have to keep those updated. Communicate is what you have to do every single day. Really get out there. Make sure people are aware of your name, your face, and your value. Seeing as though you have to be on Twitter and Facebook and updating people to let them know what's going on with you in your career. And maintain is maintaining a positive image for the rest of your life. It's not a two-day affair. It's something that you have to invest in the long term. And this is a success triangle. The first thing you need in order to be successful is passion. You have to really love what you do. You can't work for the weekend. You can't wake up in the morning and just you know, throw a brick against the wall. It's just not going to do much for you. So if you really like what you do, you'll put in more effort. You'll make sacrifices because if you really want to get to a higher level in your career, there has to be some sort of sacrifice that you have to make. And then you have expertise. Expertise is being able to fulfill job descriptions and, and support other people, and that's really how you make money. But if you're an expert and you hate what you do or what you're an expert in, you're not going to be happy. So you really need both of those. And the last piece is the support system. This is the networking component. You always have to, you have to treat your life as a networking event. You have to constantly meet new people because that's how you get really advanced. And the thing about working for a company is the more people you know early on, it's going to support you as you become a manager, director, and beyond. Because once you're at that level, it's not sustainable if you don't have a network that can help you accomplish your goals. Then there's four other key words. Authenticity. Some of these key words are buzzwords. I'm sure you've heard of them a lot. Authenticity, you have to be the real you. You don't want to copy anyone else. And your personality is your greatest asset. Transparency, you have to be upfront and honest with people. So when I got my new position at, as a social media specialist back in 2007, I told them that I was going to be speaking at different places and, and everything I was doing outside of work. Because if I didn't, they could just search for me online and find out the hard way, and that would affect my brand negatively. Value, you have to figure out what your unique value is, what your differentiation is. What makes you different than the next person? And you, you need to answer these type of questions. And then visibility. If people don't know what you're doing, you don't exist. Yeah. If you're not found in search engines or social networks, it's going to really hurt you. So there's four big brands here. We're going to go through each one. You're going to say one word that describes them. Michael Jackson. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Harris Hilton. Rich. Obama. Anyone? That's a good one. And Oprah. And the reason why I just asked you that is because I believe that if you want to manage your brand properly, your self-impression has to equal perception. So how you describe yourself has to equal how people describe you. And if you're doing that, you're manager breaker, right? So if you think you're the smartest person in the world and everyone else thinks you're dumb, you've got an issue. And you want to become an expert. This is, Edelman puts this survey out every single year and I got wind of it a few days ago, and I was like, wow, this is, this is so true. If you look at from 2009 to 2011, experts and academics are the most trusted. 
So just another reason why you need to become an expert in your field, because people will trust you, and, and that obviously supports your company. And you want to take a niche. And in general, what I believe is you have to brand yourself for the career you want, not the job you have. Because if you position yourself online based on your passion and what you're really, really interested in, which might not be what you do at your day job, you're going to attract the right opportunities. If you hate your job and you talk about how much you hate your job online, it's obviously not good. But if you position yourself saying, you know, I do, I'm this type of engineer online, you're going to keep getting the opportunities that you don't want. So it's almost like the law of attraction online is if you put your real <laughs> self out there, you're going to attract the right people, the right opportunities. If you don't, and you just copy someone else, you're going to get the wrong opportunities. It's, it really is that simple. And so the example that I share with you today is how you can position yourself as an expert and take a niche. So if you want to become a personal finance expert, it's going to be very hard to compete with Susie Orman because she's a well-known brand, multi-time New York Times bestseller, you know, TV show, you name it. But if you take a niche off of that and you say, hey, you know, I live in Minnesota and I want to become the number one personal finance expert in this area, then you can. And if you do that online, then you're going to be found and when someone searches for you in Google and not Susie Orman. So you have a chance at building a real business and getting this building. And <coughs> people who live in Minnesota, you know, Susie Orman doesn't, isn't even a consultant, but they wouldn't pay for Susie Orman anyways. They would want to deal with someone locally. Here's another example. Someone wants to become known as the SEO expert in Utah. You Google those terms, SEO expert in Utah or SEO Utah, he comes up first. So he gets all the visibility and gets all the opportunities. And the final one is Innovative Legal Counsel for General Entrepreneurs. This is a business, but look how focused that is. It's entrepreneurs who are young. They could have just said, you know, Innovative Legal Counsel. And then they're one of a billion companies. But by segmenting your business or segmenting yourself, you can be very specific and attract the right people that you can serve and grow your business on. Right, to create, create is creating the personal branding toolkit. So resume, cover letter, LinkedIn profile, which I believe is replacing um, you know, cover letters and resumes, video resumes, which are popular, but a lot of people screw them up. So if you don't have the right personality for it, don't do it, or it's going to hurt you. You know, Tufts, Tufts University, uh, they accept video resumes for the application process, so it's, it's becoming more familiar to these companies and these academics. Also, the social networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, the main ones. We'll discuss a little bit more about those. A blog versus a website. Website, very static, blog, more dynamic. And these are really just materials that you can use, you know. CD portfolio of work, a website portfolio, just to showcase what you can do to other people. And the object of doing this is to lower risk. So the more you put out there, the more high quality things you put out there, the less risk a company's, company has when, when thinking of hiring you or not. Blogging. So these are two blogs that, that we've recently created for clients. And the object of creating a blog and what you need to do now is you need to take a unique position. You don't want to recycle news. You need to have your own opinions on there because that's what's going to attract other people. And you need to have, figure out what your voice is as well. And then you have to make the investment. You do need a custom website design now. If you just steal someone else's template, it's not going to do much because there's 160 million plus blogs. A lot of competition out there. So if 100 blogs have the same template, those are probably going to be ignored. But the ones who invest in their blog or their website, those are the ones that are going to capture more attention. And then social network integration, the Google Plus One button, the Facebook Share button, all that has to be in all the blog posts and on your sites because people are finding out about new content on blogs and traditional media sites through social networks first. So if you don't enable your community to share your content quickly, you're going to miss out on building that type of community that you're looking to do. And then upkeep. You have to be committed to anything that you really care about. And if you have a blog, you have to be really committed to it. You can't just update it once every six months or it's going to make you look bad because everything is dated. So the reason why you go to Facebook all the time is because you don't want it to say, last update 2009. Like, where is this person? You know, if I drop off for 72 hours, people think I'm dead. I mean, that, this is the world we're living in. You know, a lot of people live online now. And the big three social networks, I don't know if you can see this. Together, they have like a, a, over a billion users. I mean, people aren't the same ones, but huge user bases. 
the number one question I always get asked is, what do I do with my Facebook profile? You know, employers are looking at it and searching my name on Facebook, and I don't want them to see my conversations that I have with family and friends. So keep it private. Keep everything private as much as you can. Of course, people can get their hands on information if they want to, if they want to spend money, but you need to protect yourself as much as possible. And maybe establish a fan page and use that as a professional identity. And then Twitter is great because you can connect on the same. How many, how many of you are on Twitter? Twitter's great because you're all on the same plane. And you can network and have access. Access is one of the key words to people that you wouldn't have access to before. Because you can go in and you can form relationships with experts in your industry, hiring managers, you know, directors, entrepreneurs, whoever you want. And if you specifically target these individuals, you can form relationships in a public setting. The way I look at this, the way I look at Twitter, is that instead of asking a girl or a guy over to your place the first night, first time you see them, you're establishing a, a more, you're, become, you're putting the other person in a very comfortable situation because if you, it's like taking them to the movies or to dinner. That's how I look at it. And then LinkedIn. LinkedIn's valuable especially if you already have a strong network because you just import all your contacts and then you use those contacts to tap into the second or third degree relationships. So it gives you access through a referral based system, which is more powerful than just sending someone a blind resume or a blind email to other people that can help you in your career. There's so many different ways you can promote yourself now. As simple as an email signature with a URL, a blog URL, website URL, social network profile, LinkedIn profile. There's also you know, writing a book or an ebook, starting a blog, um, you know, going to charity events, becoming a member of a, an association, becoming a leader in the association, speaking, attending networking events. There's so, so many different ways. You know, being active on blogs, commenting, and going to forums and commenting. You just have to get out there. And it takes a lot of work. If you build a website or a blog, people aren't just going to come because there's so many. So you have to be in the driver's seat again, and you have to go get those users by playing where they are, right? Fishing where they are. F fishing where the fish are. That's it. Networking now exists on three levels. When I grew up, my parents said, it's all about who you know. But with LinkedIn and other social networks, the social graph on top of them. It's now about who they know. And that information for the first time ever is available to you. You can see through your network who knows who and tap into those contacts. Before, let's see, seven to 10 years ago, you're not going to go ask all your friends, oh, who do you know? Do you know him that knows her? I mean, it's not going to work like that. So LinkedIn's a little bit more regulated where you can see, OK, I know you work at this company, but look, you are, you're, one of your contacts works at a, a company that I want to work for as well, and then you can just tap into that. So there's a lot, a lot of value there. And the last piece is, it's who knows you. And this is what happens when you start to build a brand and become more well-known, is more people know you than you know of people. And when people know you, you've probably created some degree of word of mouth so they can say nice things about you. And what other people say about your brand is more impactful than what you say about yourself, especially if they're respected by society. The New York Times says you're great. That's, that counts for a lot more than if you say that you're great to other people. If your manager says, or a VP tells your manager you're doing a great job, that counts a lot more than if you tell your manager that you're doing a good job. And we're really entering a world of one-on-one -on -one marketing. I think it's becoming more obvious every day because tweets and Facebook updates are being ignored because there's so many of them. People are following hundreds, you know, the average person in the UK on Facebook has at least a thousand friends. So it's so much content, so many people, and a lot of that content is being ignored. The best thing you can do is focus in on the right people that you want to form relationships with and spend more of your time with those people rather than trying to mass market yourself, which is very ineffective. Four rules of brand relationships that I live by. The first one is mutualism. It's creating win-win situations in business. The other person has to get as much out of the deal as you do. And if they don't, it's not going to be a long-term relationship. The next one is giving, which is the number one most important networking rule. Could you give, give some examples of that first principle? Yeah, so if you're, you know, if you're, uh, if you're in a business deal, mm -hmm. 
and you, let's say, create someone's website, and they give you $10,000, and the website's really not at the level it should be at, you're getting more than they're getting. Right. It's all about, it's really about value. But I guess maybe like, but then it's not financial transactions, if you're just talking about branding, or, or are you just talking about financial transactions? Well, I mean, financial transactions is one of them. But it, and it goes with anything. If, if you know, if you're, if you're selling something to somebody, and they feel like they're getting ripped off, it's not going to be a long-term relationship. And that's why it goes kind of goes back to giving, helping out other people without asking for anything in return, because then <coughs> people are more apt to help you. It's just naturally how it works. And then reconnecting is another really important rule. You need to constantly reconnect with people that you really care about because if they go under the radar for four years, it's not going to be a long-term relationship. But if you contact them maybe six times a year at least, then it means it shows that you care and they'll, they'll probably help you in some way if you ever need it. It's like you know if you get a Facebook friend request or message from someone you hated in high school, you're still not going to help them. But if you like someone in high school and they kept in contact with you, you might help them. It's a big difference. Um, and then the last one is uh, targeting. So it's, again, like I said a few times, being very specific with the people you want to go after. Not trying to mass market or mass network yourself. Knowing the type of people in your industry that interest you, and then focusing your attention on those. You'll get a lot more out of it. It's like uh, if you go to a networking event, instead of passing out 500 business cards, taking five business cards, meeting the five people you really, really are interested in, and spending the entire time with them. I maintain. What does Google say about you? It's a fuck for you. So what I'm going to ask you now is, um, how many people do you think Google themselves? What percentage of people Google themselves? Set so, shout out any number. 30. 30. It's actually 57% of people self Google and 53% of people Google others. And I think these are too long. I think it's just becoming more of a habit for, for people right now. And Reputation Management 2.0 because I believe Google is your permanent record. When people search for you, it can have a negative or positive impact on your career based on what shows up. You know, Anthony Weiner, the House of Representatives, he had a huge issue because he didn't understand that the web was such a public place. And it came back to bite him, of course. So if you look at what happened to him, you know, he's tweeting and, and putting up all these pictures, it's becoming uh, public. And even if one person saw it and he takes it down, that one person can do a print screen and can paste it and can share it and can reblog it and can share it with someone else and they can put a video on it. So one mistake can actually go viral now and really hurt someone's brand. And I'm not sure if he's going to retire or anything or step down. But if you, if you Google his name, it's all negative. You know, and if you go to his Wikipedia, it has this incident on it. And a new survey came out by Rich Rebo that said 35% of people post something that they later regret. What you post right now could affect you 35 years from now. Because it's always, it's always going to be in Google, whether it's on the second page or the 50th page. Someone's trying to research your background and see if they want to hire you or work with you. That's where they're turning to. And you can actually be proactive and set up a great defense to combat anything negative that would occur in the future. So Google profile, Facebook uh, professional page, where you have facebook.com slash your full name. LinkedIn, getting your URL on LinkedIn. Registering Twitter. Again, use your name, your picture, and position all these profiles and websites and blogs the same way. And everything, if you link everything together, they'll reinforce one, each other, one, one another, and they'll all start to rank higher. And it's great to reserve all this before someone else does. So you have a little bit more control. And because they rank high for your name, especially if you have a unique name, that can combat something that you would happen in the future that would be a uh, threat to you in your career. And what you need to do is you need to monitor your name, see what people are saying about you. You need to monitor different keywords that pertain to your industry and your profession. You need to monitor what people are saying about your company, maybe partners and competitors. And you can set all this up by going to google.com slash alerts, which you're probably familiar with, and setting a comprehensive alert for your name, business, etc. 
and then backtype.com does the same for blog comments. Then boardtracker.com does the same for forums online. And then you have uh, social mention, which switches your name on many different networks and microblogs. You have this Technorati, which can search one of the most authoritative blogs. Um, you have Facebook. Facebook, you can do a search through your contacts, and then you can do a search through everyone on Facebook for your name and what people are saying about you. And then Twitter, you go to search.twitter.com or tweetbeep.com and say you send a letter for your name. And you pull that all into a, a google.com slash reader. So you, have, you can follow what people are saying about you and do something about it before there's a forest fire and negative viral activity on your name. And what ends up happening is you collect all this information about what people are saying about you and company, your company and key buzzwords and all this information you care about, along with all the articles that you subscribe to and all the blogs you subscribe to. You pull all that into Google Reader, and then you take the best of that content, you organize it using delicious.com, and then you distribute it using maybe a presentation or a book or social network profiles or maybe you cite something in your blog. And this is a great system to have because it's very easy to use and if you get into the right rhythm, you can make things happen very quick and stay updated. Again, you have to get your voice online as much as possible so people remember you and you become top of mind so when they're looking to hire someone or work with someone, they think of you first. But if they don't see your face for a few weeks, you're out of sight, out of mind. And the reputation marketplace, is that cloud.com? How many, raise your hand if you're familiar with cloud.com? Anyone? So cloud.com is, it basically gives you a reputation metric of how influential you are online. So it, it now takes into account LinkedIn, but it has LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. So based on the amount of people who follow you, um, who those people are, how many people are retweeting and sharing your content, you're going to get a score from zero to 100. And the people with the highest scores for different topics get rewarded different prizes and they call it perks. And to me, this is becoming more and more important because employers are actually using this when hiring now. And that's a huge shift. And this number, the more accurate it gets, the more weight it's going to carry in the recruitment process. So it's definitely something to pay attention to. And you can bring more value to your company using social networking. Uh, sites. So recruitment, PR, marketing, you name it. Bloggers have been known to sell products that their companies sell on their blogs. And it works. Over 60% of the time, they've been able to do that. Free marketing, your company messages, your company press releases, and any big announcements, you can promote all of that through your networks and seen as a value add to your company. Public relations, you know, you have negative things happening online, people are saying, bad things about your company, get right in there, and bring the facts into play, help people out, and you can prevent the negative viral activity. Recruitment, tapping your networks to source the right people. You're probably already connected to people who would be a good fit for Google, and that really helps your company too. So really, at the end of the day, it's about bringing more value to your current job, putting in the extra effort, staying later, doing that whatever you take in order to get to that next level in your career, depending on what you're looking to do. And you need to command your future. You need to be careful about what you put online because it can come back to haunt you. It can really screw things up for you when you get uh, older. You have to really love what you do. Passion is the only thing that's sustainable, so if you hate what you do, it's just going to be very hard for you to be successful at doing that. You have to form relationships. That's what all this is about. The more people you know, the more people you know, who are connected to you and who care what you have to say, the better. But you also want to be targeted. You want to try and mask over yourself again. And you got to work hard. I mean, go back to what I said before. You know, a lot of the stuff I discussed today takes a little bit more time than what you would normally do in a day job. But it's going to help you. It's going to save part of your career and allow you to advance in the future. It's an investment in yourself. So I want to thank you today. Uh, my book, Me 2.0, all of you have it in front of you. And personalbrainblog.com has over 2,000 articles on personal brain. And we have a newsletter, too, that goes out monthly if you want to subscribe to that. And I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, you feel free to ask it now. If you have a question later, you can always email me at dan at millennialbraining.com. Appreciate it.